Hello, Carl Fagerstrom. Welcome to Australia. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. It's a pleasure to be here and with you. Thank you. So we have uh, a long history of working in smoking cessation. And this interview really is about how you feel there have been changes and what's happened in your career, do you think, since you started this really to today? What, what do you think has been the biggest change? Oh, there are many things that has actually changed them and for the better. I mean, remember, when I started, uh, you had to be surrounded by smoke in airplanes and restaurants everywhere. Your clothes were smelling when you came back home from a restaurant, etc. That is largely gone completely. So we live in a much better environment. Uh, the awareness of uh, smoking as being a dependence and the drug dependence didn't exist at all when I started. It was just a bad habit. Uh, that has um, had some positive ramifications. Uh, for example, development of treatments, uh, maybe also on the readiness to seek treatment uh, among smokers that today label themselves as at least partly dependent uh, and I think that helps uh, because if you were just suffering from a, a, a routine, a bad habit, uh, you must have a bad character, uh, otherwise you should be able to give it up. Uh, so the, the whole field is getting recognition and uh, when I and maybe you also started there weren't many conferences where one could meet people alike with us. Today there are, and uh, it seems to be developing into a more or less medical specialty as, as many other topics in, in medicine now. You think it's um, mm -hmm. um, feasible that you will see tobacco treatment specialists as a specialty, do you think? Uh, it is unfortunate in the sense that by medical standards where this would be long is in the psychiatry and the psychiatrists. But uh, <coughs> sorry, they do not seem to be very interested at all. They're less interested, as a matter of fact, than lung physicians and, and, uh, and general practice physicians. So, so uh, I don't know where this would um, end up. I mean, for the time being, it looks to be that someone that is really interested, and often there is a general practitioner or a lung physician, makes sure to get some funding and sets up a smoker's uh, clinic. But, um, but who knows? In many ways, this is a dependence on board with dependences to usually illicit drugs and and uh, it might be where it ends up and the psychiatrists, they have to give up themselves and get interested in yes. smoking. So we certainly have seen improvements in mental health, have we not in smokers um, with mental illnesses when they stop smoking because there's a fear isn't there that something will go wrong with yes. your mental health patients yes. as if they have historically always been smokers. Yes, yes. No, you are right. No, I, I think that is a uh, a sort of a, a hinder, a blockage for the psychiatrists that they think that they cannot or shouldn't even stop as long as they do have their mental problem, eh? which is, is, is wrong as you are saying. Eh? We have uh, here in this country, in Australia, a, a group of addiction medicine specialists who are taking up more after a long time incorporating nicotine addiction as part of the suite of addictions. I wonder if how you view addiction medicine specialists perhaps instead of psychiatrists taking up the role. I think that's, um, I mean addiction special, specialists, they would have uh, better knowledge, uh, experience, how to actually uh, confront or not confront but to treat uh, the, the smokers. Uh, so on that side it would be good. Uh, remains to be seen a little bit how the smoker 
feels, if he or she is comfortable by going to the same place as the heroin addicts or the outcasts of alcohol or whatever drug they are, they are using, yeah, that, uh, but, uh, that, that can be handled, I suppose. So. And what do you think is the future for this? Um, I guess for the topic of nicotine dependence and for treatments, where do you think the future is? It's not going to be easier to help the remaining smokers. Uh, I am pessimistic also when it comes to better, more effective treatments. I'm sure in a sense uh, that we can put a pill in the mouth of the smoker that really helps he or she to give up smoking, but such a pill will have fairly terrible side effects. Uh, and it seems to me that in this field, uh, the society, the medical authorities, they do not accept much side effects at all. Uh, then the drugs are worn by black boxes or taken off the market. Uh, so from that point of view, I, 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 I think you could turn off the main switch more or less and make it easy to give up smoking, but it's not likely to be accepted. So to develop something that makes you function and the body function normally without side effects and sort of takes away the desire and the dependence, yeah, treat the dependence mechanisms, it's, it's, it's not going to be here. So what I think we will see in the future, that is a um, a pressure on the prevalence rate that it will go down but uh, slower and slower and we you and I and other seeing patients need to tailor the treatment uh, we do have two or three different drugs uh, and to who do we give the specific drug and in what those uh, combinations etc and that's uh, where I think we can uh, learn more and, and be more effective, at least in relative terms. Of course, that, that's rather expensive to do that. I mean, in the past it was much more a one-size-fits-all, and now that's therefore not the case, certainly not in your country, in my country, where the prevalence has gone down so low that we really need to treat individuals. So do you think there's a role for one-size-fits-all in other countries where the prevalence is higher? Yeah, yes. Sir. I, I, I think uh, it's, it, for, for the majority of smokers it is easier to stop uh, when, when there are many that smoke, meaning that many aren't actually that dependent, many are smoking simply because it's a social norm to smoke, everyone else in my neighborhood or, or, or um, uh, uh, club smokes, uh, so um, that's, that doesn't call for as much differential diagnosis and uh, specific treatments as it would in your and my country, mm -hmm. yes, I agree. Yes. So the, tr the trials that have been done in countries where the prevalence is very high and the success rates are very good in some drugs don't necessarily translate to countries like yours and mine where the prevalence rates are very low and so we, as we've said, pick the low hanging fruit. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Thank you very much, Carl Feinstrom. Thank you, Renee.